Hello YouTube, it's Troy here and welcome back to the channel of The Lonely Wolf. Okay, so to, in today's video we're going to do our first part in the philosophy of mathematics. Now, please take note that I've already released this video previously, but I wasn't very satisfied with the aesthetic or the sound quality. So what I've done for your convenience is upload this video again, but hopefully with a better sound quality now that I have, you know, a microphone and I'm not using a headset. Okay, so let's dive into this. Now before we start this, I just want to let you know that this particular video, it's meant for beginner level mathematics. So you don't have to necessarily be qualified in mathematics. Um, so even if you have no mathematical background, there's much of this video that you can still enjoy. So join me from the ground up as we explore the philosophy of mathematics. So the first question people may ask is, what does philosophy have to do with mathematics? So we're going to look at three distinctive um, branches of philosophy that people study. Now, the first thing is the metaphysics of numbers. So when we talk about metaphysics, we talk about the inherent existence of many things. So that's one of the parts of metaphysics. So what we're going to be answering in relation to mathematics are, do numbers exist? And do they exist independent of human consciousness? Okay, so do numbers and humans, are we independent of each other? So would numbers exist without human invention or without human consciousness? When we look at aesthetics, we look at how mathematics is related to beauty and form. Now these are going to be in part one and part two, and then the third video I'll release will be on logic and arguments, so it's an introduction to logic. As I said before, this is going to be an introductory video. Okay, so before we actually look at the existence of numbers, we have to look at what we're actually talking about. So what are the different types of numbers? Okay, so the first type of number is a natural number. So think about primitive civilizations, um, they had to be able to count things. So for example, they had to count the number of sheep they had, the number of cattle they had. Okay, so naturally people um, use these type of numbers. So this was the very starting point. So it's basically one, two, three, four, and five. Now the one thing really important about natural numbers is they don't include zeros. So it only goes one, two, three, four, five, and we can count on um, potentially to infinity. Now, as we build our number system, then we thought, okay, what about zero? Where does that fit in? Well, the whole numbers, they include all of the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and five, and it also includes zero as well. And as we built up our numbers, we had to look at what negative numbers were. So for example, if we fell into debt with somebody else, so the amount of money we had becomes a negative. So for example, if I owe you $100, that makes it 100 negative. But then we had to look at rational. So for example, we looked at fractions. So for example, half of something. So um, for example, um, if we're cutting something in half, then that's where we had to use fractions. So rational numbers are any numbers that can be written as a fraction. So they can include um, decimals that terminate, and they also include recurring decimals. So we can show mathematically that a recurring decimal can be written as a fraction. And then last but not least, we have the irrationals. Okay, so it includes all the previous numbers. So plus, you know, existence of numbers such as pi, for example. So pi is related to the circumference of a circle. Okay, so now that we know what these numbers are, so take a moment just to digest, you know, what these numbers are. So now we're going to look at the inherent existence of these numbers. Okay, so the first thing we'll look at is natural numbers. All right, so what I'm going to argue is that natural numbers would exist regardless of human consciousness. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to have the figure three, that that's going to be written in the sky, and it's always been that way. Okay, so the only thing that's been humanly created is the actual naming of these numbers. So we could name something as one. Okay, we could look at two cats, and we could say that's two. Now, the only thing we're contributing to that is the language. Okay, by naming these numbers, we're giving a language. That's the human contribution to mathematics in the case of natural numbers. But there are so many patterns that exist in nature that are really independent of human consciousness. So one example of natural numbers is the patterns we find in electron configuration. Okay, so if we look at the diagram here, so the first shell will hold a maximum of two electrons, then the second shell holds eight, and the third holds eight, and there's a pattern that keeps going. So for example, if we look at a sodium atom, so the atomic, atomic number is 11. Okay, so that means there's 11 electrons in this particular atom, and they have to be arranged according to the 2, 8, and 8 rule. So in the inner shell, we can contain two. Okay, then in the outer shell, we can contain eight. Okay, so because that is made 10, 
we only need one more on the outer one. So have a think about the natural existence of this number beyond human consciousness. So these atoms will exist regardless of whether or not we're aware of it, and even without humans, these atoms have existed. So atoms have existed all the way through evolution, okay, so from the, from the very beginning. So there was oxygen, there was hydrogen, so there were things in the atmosphere, and they existed long before we came along. All we did is put numbers next to it, or we named those numbers. So the patterns that existed in, you know, atomic configuration, oh sorry, electron configuration, okay, they've existed. So we're going to look at a few more examples of natural numbers as they've existed. The next one is called the Fibonacci sequence. Now the sequence goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and 21. Alright, so if you want to pause for a moment and have a look at those numbers and see what the pattern is, if you've never studied this before. But if you have, you'll know what it is. Okay, so have a look at the first two terms. We have 1 and 1. Those two numbers will add to give 2. Then if we put 2 and 1, that gives us 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. And 5 plus 8 is equal to 13. Okay, so basically every term in this Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the two terms that were previous to that. So for example, if we locate 5, the previous two numbers were 2 and 3, and they added to give that number in the sequence. So how is this related to nature? Let's have a look at what we call the Fibonacci spiral. Okay, so let's start off with a square. It has a unit of one length. Okay, so that's the one. Then what we're going to do is attach another square of equal unit that makes one. Okay, so the total length of that rectangle is now two units long. So what we're going to do is construct a square that is two units. Okay, so if we look at the length of this one now, we now have three. Okay, so now we're going to construct a square that has three units. And then if we have a look at the total length, it's now five. So now we're going to construct a square with five units. Okay, so we keep building on with these squares like that. Okay, so let's have a look at what type of, um, how that relates to the natural world. So if we trace out a path like this, we have what's called a Fibonacci spiral. So think about things in nature that go into a spiral formation. So for example, it could be a seashell. Okay, so Fibonacci numbers, they're used to express a lot of natural phenomena. Okay, so that's an example of you know, how we have patterns in nature that can really exist without human consciousness. Now, as I said before, the only thing that we've added is we've named those numbers. And one last example, so this one's a really interesting example, it's bee ancestry. Okay, so in this particular type of bee, okay, a male will only have one mother. Okay, so if the mother doesn't mate, she will produce a male. But if she does have a partner and mates with a male, then she'll produce a female. So let's construct a family tree here. Okay, so as I said before, we have a male. Okay, so the male can only have one mother. So we have that one. Now, we have a female. So how did the female come about? Well, it had to have two parents. Okay, so if we trace the male line, the male would have a female, but then the female would have two parents. Okay, so we keep tracing back. The female has two parents, the male has one parent, and the female has two parents. Okay, so let's count the number in each generation. So if we look at the bottom of the family tree, we have one, we have one, then two, then three, then five. So each generation, the number of bees in the population of that generation is generated by a Fibonacci number sequence. Now let's have a look at what would happen just hypothetically if we started with a female. So a female has to have two parents. The male has one, the female has two, and we keep constructing the family tree as such. Now let's count the number in each generation. So it goes one, two, three, then five, and then eight. So again, it follows the same Fibonacci sequence. So let's go back to look at the existence of natural numbers. So in the first panel, we're gonna look at a quote um, from a very um, famous mathematician. So the quote is, the dear Lord created the whole numbers, all the others are a work of man. Okay, so when we talk about whole numbers, remember what the definition of that was? It started off with a zero, and then it also has one, two, three, four, and five. So according to this theory, those numbers are the dear Lord. So that means that they, that implies that it exists without human consciousness, but then the other numbers, so fractions and decimals and infinite numbers and irrational numbers, those are the work of men. So we're gonna explore that claim. So as I said before, there's a lot of agreement or disagreement. So we don't have a consensus about the existence because 
professors are still debating about this to this very day. Now, the second one is a quote from Richard Muller, so who is a professor of physics. The early Greeks and Romans thought it self-evident that zero did not exist. So zero we can think of as nothing. Isn't it obvious that nothing can't have existence? So nothing can't have existence. All right, so I'm going to let you mull that around in your mind and think about, okay, so does zero exist if nothing can't have existence? So that's one of those quotes that you really need to reverberate around in your mind and have a think about that. Now, what about negative numbers? So the way in which we use those, so obviously we had to invent, we had to have a negative number system because we're dealing thing, with things. So for example, temperature. Now, money's a good example. So if you owe $100, that means you have negative $100. And we also consider negative charges. So for example, protons are positive charges, electrons are negative charges. Now money, obviously money is the creation of, you know, the humankind. Okay, so we created money to buy and sell goods and services. So we could argue that in the case of money, that it's purely sort of a human creation. And so the idea of a negative amount of money, that can't really exist because money wouldn't exist if it wasn't for human consciousness or human ingenuity. But think about temperature. So temperature is something that naturally exists. So we naturally feel cold or hot. And that temperature is going to be the same regardless of whether or not we're alive or dead. But think about the construction of temperature. So that relies on an arbitrary number system. So for example, a degree Celsius, it places zero as the freezing point. So we can have negative below freezing and positive for above freezing. But that's really an arbitrary number line that we've invented for ourselves. So we could have chosen any particular number scale so that we wouldn't have negative temperatures. Okay, so we could also argue that in the case of temperature, we're measuring a scale that was created by human achievement, okay, and might not be dependent, so might be, might not be necessarily independent of human consciousness. But the one thing that, um, when I think about negative numbers, the case that we could make for the inherent existence of negative numbers so to counteract positive numbers, because we know that they cancel each other out. So a negative one and a positive one, they neutralize each other. So I think of negative and positive charges in electrons or protons. So that's probably the one example I could think of in which we might make the case that negative numbers could exist without human consciousness. Let's have a look at irrational numbers. So irrational numbers are those type of numbers that if we define colloquially, we can define them as you know numbers that we can't really write in a fraction form. So if you type them into a calculator, you'll get a string of numbers of random type of numbers that appears. So the first one is the square root of two. So square root of two, that can come from a triangle that has the sides one and one, a right angle triangle, and using the Pythagoras, we get the square root of two. So that's something that we can measure with a ruler. So that length appears to exist. Then we look at a circle. So a pi is basically the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. But then there's a complication. We go to Plato's theory of form. Now the definition of a circle, so that's where pi comes from. So pi is really coming from our definition of the properties of circles. So the definition of a circle is basically a shape that's formed when all points are equally distant from the center. So have a think about that. So every point on a circle has to be equally distant from the center. So on the surface level, it seems, yep, we can create circles, they exist. We can draw them, we can use a compass. But can the perfect circle really exist? So this is where we get into Plato's theory of form. Now, if you zoom in on the circle, they're made of microscopic particles. Those particles are constantly in motion. So because they're in motion, they're gonna deviate away from the length that we've defined. So that really contradicts the definition of a circle so saying that all points are equally distant from the center because they're not, okay? Because some particles on a microscopic level are gonna be further away. So it's the idea that we can't really find a perfect circle that exists in this universe. So that goes into Plato's theory of form. Now, this is a concept that I'm gonna explore in my next video when I look at aesthetics, when we look at the theory of form. This is gonna be the bit that might be a little bit harder. So this is imaginary numbers. So for those of you who've done a little bit of maths, um, you might have an advantage. Okay, so let's start with an equation. We've got x squared plus one is equal to zero. Now, if we move the plus one, we get negative one for the square root. Now, sorry, for the square, x squared is equal to negative one. Our next step is we have to take the square root or the plus and minus square root. And if we get that, we get the square root of negative one. Now, if you're not really familiar with maths very much, try putting a negative one into your calculator and then finding the square root of that number and you'll find that it doesn't have a solution, it'll come up with an error. 
because this particular number doesn't exist in the real number system. Now, be very careful with their wording here. So we're not saying the number doesn't exist. We're saying it doesn't exist in the system of real numbers. It exists in another system, which is the complex number system. All right, so what we have is square root of negative one is equal to i. So i or perhaps j is sometimes used, and that's used to denote a, the square root of a negative number. So that's equal to i. But if we put i squared, we get negative one. So this leads us to define complex numbers. So complex numbers have real parts and imaginary parts. So for example, if we put two plus three i, so that means that the real part of that number is two and the imaginary part is three. So if the imaginary part was zero, that would make it a real number. But if the real part like the two, if we turn that into a zero, that means it would be purely imaginary. So I guess the first question that people ask, and whenever I teach the concept of imaginary, um, some students will ask, why are we using these numbers that don't really exist kind of naturally? Okay, so we have created a number system, you know, through our human thought. So very abstract thought, we've created this number system for ourselves. So these numbers exist in our created number system, not in the real number system. Okay, so that's the question, does this number really exist? So could this number exist without human consciousness? So let's have a look at why we actually use those numbers. Now, just remember that we say i squared is equal to negative one. Now in algebra, so this is where some people might get a bit lost. So you can fast forward this scene a little bit if you're not um, very good at the maths. Okay, so this is a factorization. It's called the sum of two squares, or sorry, the difference of two squares. So it says x squared take away y squared is x plus y, x take away y. Okay, so that means that if you've got two squares and you're doing the difference, then we can do the factor as such. So for example, if we say x squared take away three squared, it just means it's x take away three times x plus three. Remember to put them in brackets. Now what happens if you've got x squared plus y squared? So this is where we artificially create um, the negative. Okay, so we can't do this with plus. It has to be a minus. So how can we do that? Well, if we go x squared take away y squared and i squared. So taking away i squared is like taking away negative one squared. Okay, so that creates a difference of two squares. So artificially we've put in an imaginary number so that we can use this property of factorization. So we can use x take away y i, x plus y i. So in an abstract way, complex numbers or more specifically imaginary numbers, they really help us to do certain algebra type tasks that we wouldn't be able to do with the real number system. So what are the real world implications? Well, firstly, in electronics, for example, there are a lot of differential equations and they rely on the mathematical use of complex numbers. It also comes in with waveform analysis. So in waveforms, we're looking at numbers that exist and perhaps when we're looking at quantum mechanics. So this is where I'm very limited. So for example, we might be looking at the position of a particle throughout space. So sometimes we have to do some complex mathematics and it involves imaginary numbers to actually use that. So what can we say about the existence of these numbers? So this is probably, um, so the more complex the numbers get, the more in which we have to question the reality of these numbers without human consciousness. So some people may argue, so two sides of the coin. Some people may argue that with electronics, um, so some of those things like electrical charges, um, they've always existed because of lightning, etc. Or there's certain wave waveforms that exist in nature, regardless of our consciousness. And we've simply made a language in which we can model the things that go on around us. So the numbers have been created by ourselves, but they're expressing something that already is inherent in the universe. But on the other hand, you know, people argue that imaginary numbers are purely a human construct because the numbers don't inherently exist because we're taking something that is imaginary when it comes to our real number system. Now, as I said, there's no definitive answer. It's just a way for us to think about the for and against and to just think about the existence of these things. Okay, so let's have a look at a few concluding remarks. Okay, so the first thing that happens in mathematics when we introduce a new number from the number system, so for example, we started with natural numbers like one, two, three, four, five. So the minute we start adding new things onto our number system, we become more uncomfortable. So especially at the higher levels, when we start doing irrational numbers and then we start doing imaginary numbers, that's when we start to get a little bit uncomfortable and that's normal. But then philosophers, they question the existence of other types of real numbers. So for example, a zero. Okay, so one thing that we could say is that yes, the numbers are the product of human imagination. So it's a language we've created to express what is there. Okay, so they are expressing the things that really exist. Now, the next thing we're gonna look at is the infinite. 
Okay, so to explain the concept of infinity, it's something that we use, but is it something that really exists? So do we know what infinity looks like? Okay, so this is where we really get our minds to do a bit of a workout, I guess. So the exercise we do is we consider taking number one, we halve this number, and then you halve this number, you get a quarter, and then you halve that and you get an eighth. Okay, so what would happen if we ended up going forever? So would we shrink that number down to zero? Okay, so have a look at the sequence of numbers. Okay, so we keep going like that. So we're getting really, really close. And you can see on the graph there, we're starting off very high. Okay, we're gradually going there. So do we actually touch zero? Now the answer is no, we never reach zero. So we can reach 0 0.000001. So in other words, we're getting infinitely closer to zero, but we cannot touch the zero. So that particular curve, if we join it up with the line or a curve, it will never touch the x-axis. So that's one of the examples of where we think about infinity. Now for people who may study calculus, so calculus is, um, the differential calculus to be specific, is looking at a particular point that's on a curve, and we're looking at how to calculate the slope at that particular point. So what we're doing is we're drawing a tangent to that particular point and measuring the slope. So calculus is the tool in which we can use that. Okay, so before we develop the concept of doing this, we started off with a neighboring point and said, well, let's join up these two and we'll calculate the slope. But it's not very accurate, is it? It looks way off. So intuitively, mathematicians decided, well, let's go closer and let's go closer. And so the closer you get, the more accurate your approximation is. And so we can get very, very close. Now, the thing is we can't touch that particular point. So it can't be a distance of zero, but it can be infinitely, infinitely close to that particular point. So that's another, another example of the way in which we use infinity. We're looking at something that's infinitely close. Let's explore the existence of infinity. So this is where we're really gonna blow our minds apart. So we're gonna look at Aristotle, so the potential infinity. So if we look at one, two, three, four, five, and six and seven, and we keep on going, so where does that number sequence stop? Well, potentially that could keep on going forever. We could count forever and ever. So think of it about the analogy of traveling endlessly in a spaceship. Okay, then there's also something called an actual infinity. So it's something that's a little bit more local. So for example, if we consider the density of an object that is so dense that it would have an infinite density. So that, so that sometimes comes into play when scientists may look at black holes, but this is an area I don't really want to get into. Okay, let's have a look at the theory of Cantor. So let's say that there's one, two, three, four, five, and it keeps going on and on and on. Okay, so people could argue that's an infinite set. So there's an infinite number of objects in that set. Let's have a look at the subset. So the subset are the even numbers. So two, four, six, eight, and it keeps going. So we could also argue that that particular sequence could also keep on going forever and ever. But then we have a bit of a contradiction in our minds. Okay, there's some sort of cognitive dissonance that comes about. The reason why is because the first set, we're saying the first set is in infinite, we're saying the second set is infinite, so we think of the number infinity perhaps, which is not really a number, but we think of infinity for both of these sets. But the second set is only half the size of the first set, so how can they both be the same? So that's the kind of dissonance we have when we think about the concept of infinity. That's how our minds sometimes get a bit, I guess, tripped out when it comes to this. So let that reverberate in your mind just for a moment. Now the idea of infinity, so this is where I get a bit uncertain about some of these things. All right, so first of all, maybe the theory of Einstein. So the universe expanded from a long time ago from an infinite density. Okay, so this is just a theory. Now I could be getting this wrong because I'm not really a scientist. I only deal with um, mathematics itself. But some people believe that there was an infinite density somewhere and that was the expansion. There's also the idea of how the universe could contract. Now some of the questions we ask ourselves are, is the universe infinite in its dimension? So that really um, depends on the shape of the universe. So it's something that I don't really know about. Okay, so some people believe that you, keep, you could keep traveling in a straight line and you keep going on forever. Some people believe the universe is a circular type thing. And so people have theories about the different shapes of the universe. And we think of the implications of infinity as well. It's a very difficult concept to actually get our heads around. So here are some concluding thoughts. Okay, so as I said, there is a debate about the existence of numbers of all kinds, not just the imaginary ones. Okay, so that's a really important thought. So it is a debate. So I'm not here to provide you with answers because I don't think even the professionals, the PhD people, the professors in mathematics, they are still arguing about this thing. Okay, so they're still having a very philosophical debate. We can present the for and against for all of these different numbers.
but we don't really have a conclusive answer. Now we've also noticed, as I've shown you, the physical world holds many interesting patterns. So for example, the Fibonacci numbers. Now mathematics, part of it is a human creation because it's a language. Now we created the, the language by calling two, so we looked at two things and we called it two. Now it's two because we called it two, but the underlying thing there still exists. So that thing would still exist without the human consciousness, we've just named it and we've labelled it. But then when it comes to some numbers, we can debate whether or not those things would exist. So for example, irrational numbers, we can debate those, as well as imaginary numbers, we can certainly spend a lot of time, as well as the idea of infinity when it comes to explaining the universe. Okay, we can also debate the existence of those without human consciousness. Now it comes back to the first statement is that um, a lot of people, so my conclusion thought is I definitely agree that the natural numbers, so one, two, three, four, five, I believe that they are very much real. Okay, so they would exist without human consciousness. We've just put a name to those numbers and there are other numbers that could exist. But when we get to the imaginary numbers or the other type of numbers, that's when we get into a bit of a gray area where we're still debating on that. Okay, so thank you very much for joining me for this video. So I'll see you again in my next video where I'll be talking about mathematics in relation to beauty and aesthetics. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.